Hello, and welcome back to the Darkness Underneath podcast. This is episode 3 of Roy DeMeo and Murder Machine, titled The Butcher and His Apprentices. If you can't tell by the title already, this episode is going to include some extreme violence in it. And if extreme violence disturbs you, you probably should skip this episode. In fact, you should probably skip the DeMeo crew altogether, because they only get worse from here. And you should probably really wonder, why the fuck am I studying the DeMeo crew, who were like the Manson family of the Mafia, especially from a source called the Darkness Underneath podcast? Now it's time to begin. It's strange how we walk through places oblivious to what events happened there before, Some of the most ordinary places have fascinating pasts. But as fascinating as some of those histories can be, if the walls could speak to you and tell you what's happened there, sometimes what you would hear wouldn't be so pleasant. If such a thing were possible, some of these places would be repositories for bad memories and nightmares. Now, there's a key food grocery store operating today in Queens. There's nothing unusual about the store. It's just a key food. There's nothing unusual about it except for its history. A history that's very macabre and which would probably disturb the shoppers if they knew about it. You see, back in 1975, it was called Pantry Pride. And the crime that happened there was like something out of a horror movie. Those crimes done to one man would be only the beginning. The beginning of a nightmare that would lead to the deadliest mob crew in history. Roy DeMeo's crew, the murder machine. Now it's time to go back to the end of 1974 and into 1975 to see what happened between Andrea Katz and the DeMeo crew. Chris Rosenberg was doing well for himself. You know, Donato's shop? which was actually a chop shop, called, weirdly enough, Carphobio Repairs, and Chris was by far closer to Roy than anybody else. He was the first to go to Roy's barbecues, Roy put him as second in command, and he really did care about this guy in a way that DeMeo rarely cared about anybody. Now, if Roy was impressed with Chris, Nino was impressed. But Nino, who didn't talk much, and when he did was comically cantankerous at times, noticed Chris's long hair, and said, He needs to get a haircut. He looks like a fucking hippie. So yeah, everything was going well for Chris. Money, respect, appreciation, even if he needed a haircut. And then one day, Chris's luck turned really bad, although he kind of brought it on himself. Now, Chris didn't just have a comic book-like temper. No, he also had a comic book-like propensity for surviving horrific gunshots, from enemies of the DeMeo gang. Chris was headed to the garage one day when Andrea fired at a distance with a semi-automatic sniper rifle. One bullet went through his arm, another bullet bounced off his lower jaw, spinning him around just as another bullet headed for his chest, missed and became a glancing wound instead. Chris was disfigured and had to have reconstructive surgery Then, later, he began wearing a beard because he was unhappy with the result. Everybody knew who did it. Although, nobody had seen Andrea, they didn't have a lot of enemies at that point. So, the crew began traveling together with weapons. Nobody went by themselves, nobody went unarmed. And, this led to a corrections officer spotting them in the Gemini Lounge one day with weapons. He told the cops, the cops came, And they arrested Patty, Joey, and Anthony. They found pistols, and they found the blackjack that Joey used to beat the shit out of Andrea. The crew was pissed. Chris was in the hospital. Now three of their members were arrested. Sure, the Gemini twins were bailed out, but they didn't know how long they were going to be in prison after the court date. Also, their weapons were confiscated. And although Chris was fully going to recover, Besides a ragged face and scar tissue, he was going to look like a Hollywood movie monster for a while. That motherfucker Andrea 
was causing them a lot of problems. It was time to talk to the big man himself. Mr. Doesn't Fuck Around Roy DeMeo. He'd know what to do. Roy and the rest of them assembled together in the Gemini Lounge. It was time to get down to business. Roy wasn't concerned about the legal problems that the boys were going through. He had a lawyer that got them off with just a slap on the wrist. However, he was concerned about Andrea, and he had a solution for that. With what he knows about the cars, he can hurt us. Just kill the fucking guy. What are you afraid of? Just whack him and get rid of the body. No body, no crime, Roy said. I ain't afraid. That asshole ruined my face, Chris said. Roy came up with a plan. He called a few people, contacts he had, and Joey Testa brought in a friend, Henry Borelli, who was responsible for getting them out on bail. Now, Henry Borelli didn't seem like the type to be in the DeMeo crew. He was cheerful. He was likable. Henry could also be funny. His jokes sometimes were a little bit cheesy, as you can see if you ever look at any of the home movie videos that are online. He tells a joke in that. He sounds like he's straight out of Jersey Shore there, but that's because he's drunk. And in fact, he was so likable that many years from now, one day, a jury member would feel bad about sentencing him. Albert DeMeo, Roy's son, referred to him as the type of guy that seemed like he should be in a suit. I don't think that Henry had as much psychopathy as some of the other crew members. He was very much a follower and was very tribal. He had worked for Roy the longest, even more than Chris. He was jealous of Chris because he wanted to be so close to Roy. And he was easily used and weaponized by Roy. But none of this makes him any less culpable for his crimes, and he belonged in prison right there with the rest of them. Although it isn't clear, Henry, like the younger crew members, probably had never killed anybody before at this point, but he'd be really good at it when he did. He was particularly good with guns. So it wasn't going to be easy to get to this Andrea Katz. He only went two places now. Home and work. Same schedule every day. He had his brother with him, and they were both armed. When he was at home, he didn't go outside. When he was at work, he always had people around him. Roy did know from his crew members that Andrea Katz had a weakness. What was that weakness? Women. Okay, that's most guys' weakness. If there was one thing that would get Andrea Katz's guard down, it was women. And they needed to find a really hot girl. Well, Henry knew this girl who was really hot. She was a party girl. She was unattached. He used to be having an affair with her, but they called it off because it wasn't going to go anywhere, and it fizzled out over time. But they remained friends. Her name was Judy. She was kind of gullible, and Henry reached out to her, and he asked her to try to seduce this guy and get him to go out on a date. She was hesitant. It's like, no, I don't want to do that. She was thinking he and his friends might want to harm this guy, this Andrea, and she didn't want to be a part of that. Now, this is late 74. Throughout his life, Roy would always have several childhood friends that he would remain close to. A few of those friends could even remember how devastated he was over Chubby. There was Frank Frangi, an electrical contractor. He was probably Roy's best friend from childhood growing up in Flatlands. There was also Frank's older brother, Richard, who would become a Hollywood actor after he got out of prison and star in movies such as Serpico and Carlito's Way more recently. Now, Frank was the guy that Roy would go to his farm to shoot guns, and he continued to do so, sometimes with his crew, or his son, or sometimes both. Ironically, Frank would borrow massive amounts of money from Roy and be close to him and never have a clue he killed anybody. He thought he was just a loan shark. But then there were a few less innocent friends that Roy had growing up. Roy had a talent for finding very crooked individuals, and he also had a talent for corrupting individuals around him. Two of those individuals were men that he grew up with, the Doherty brothers, Charles and John. And though they weren't part of his crew, they were more like peers. They helped him commit crimes and were important in helping him get away with them. Now, Charles worked as a bartender part-time at the Gemini Lounge, and John was a crooked cop who acted as Roy's spy. He was perfectly situated for the job, too, since he was promoted to the auto theft crime unit and was an auto theft detective. 
John found the perfect corrupt partner, too, with this other lousy cop, Peter Caliboro. If I'm butchering the name, I apologize. I've never heard it pronounced. So Peter began acting as an agent for Roy and spying from 74 to 75 on the Andrea Katz case after Andrea Katz began meeting with a grand jury to indict members of their crew. Roy and Peter would meet outside the Gemini Lounge in the shadows, and Peter would give him information. 75 comes along, and Katz has gone before a grand jury. First, he identifies Chris, so that's a serious problem. Well, now he identifies Roy, and Roy's angry. So he puts the pressure on Borelli again, and she's like, well, how do you know he's even going to want to date me? And both he and Joey exchange grins, because she's hot and doesn't realize it. Henry had told her he wasn't going to hurt him, but the guy owed him money. He was just going to talk to him. He was just going to drive up and talk to him because he kept running away and refused to talk to him, and it was important he gets his money back. And Henry managed to finally convince her to go flirt with this guy and try to get him on a date. She dresses up and looks good. But she goes to his work. Cats. He sees this beautiful, foxy girl. And he just can't help himself, even though he knows it's stupid. And he flirts with her, and she finally agrees to take him out on a date, even though she planned to agree the entire time. They set up a date for that Friday. He drives in from Brooklyn. So she's waiting up there and looking out the window down. And she sees Katz pull up in his really nice car. And immediately... Chris, Joey, Henry, and Anthony pull up and block him in. Yeah, that's the apartment that you could see if you're watching the visuals that this happened at. They get out of the car and they surround this guy. Now, Judy looks down and she looks in horror because she can tell that they don't want to just talk to this guy. They're very menacing looking. She doesn't know who Chris is. She doesn't know who Anthony is, but she does recognize Joey. And hears him say, hey, we only want to talk to you. He shrugs in the dark and seems to be hesitant. And then Anthony grabs him from behind and puts some kind of rope or something over him. There's a struggle and they force him violently into their Lincoln and drive off. She stares down in horror. The next day comes. And his car is still there, and she realizes that they were definitely going to hurt him. Finally, since it was parked in front of a fire hydrant, the police come, and they have the car towed away. It was ironically on a Friday the 13th, back in June of 1975, when Katz was murdered at Pantry Pride. The building I showed you in the beginning that's called Key Foods today. Managers are going to be thrilled when I end up sending them a bunch of morbid tourists like myself to Key Foods at that store in Queens to see where Katz was eviscerated. So that night, Katz was dragged into the meat department, and he had to be absolutely horrified, hoping for death quickly. There, Roy DeMeo waited, probably looking every bit like a slasher movie villain and a deranged psychopath once he put his butcher outfit on. Only a few statements of what was said are public, and it'd be nice to think that Katz wasn't beaten senseless first by Chris and maybe Roy, two sadists who had no problem torturing anybody, but that seems unlikely. So what's known is that Roy told his crew that they had to make sure Katz was never seen again, that they had to make him disappear. Joey and Anthony restrained Katz and held him up. It enraged Chris swung and hacked away with the furiousness of a madman at the struggling and screaming cats. His strikes were deliberate and methodical, his heart. Blood wouldn't have squirted everywhere like in the movies. That's very Hollywood. But it would have spilled, and the ribcage probably cracked and broke since Chris was probably striking as hard as he could. The pain would have been excruciating before he went into shock, and it would have made cats forget how afraid he was. The heart would have been perforated by the steak knife and stopped pretty quickly. Katz's eyes might have rolled back, his body jerking. The Gemini twins then let Katz drop with a sickening thunk where Katz rolled over onto his side. But Chris kept hacking away, his lips distorted in a fury. He was mutilating the back of the corpse now, leaving deep, bloody, and jagged slices and nicking into the backbones. 
there would have been a meaty sound. Chris struck the dead cats 15 times in the back with useless gestures that were only going to cause more of a mess to clean up before Roy finally ordered him to stop. This guy was so pissed about his face. Now it was time for the hard part. Roy and Joey, the only two who had worked as apprentice butchers, had slipped on white butcher coats and yellow and orange gloves. They also had boning knives with them. Now the five men had already talked about the broader details. Roy instructed them, we have to wait a little bit until the blood gets hard before they can continue their work. Roy's wait time was 45 minutes. So they had 45 minutes to prepare things. And Chris and Anthony then began laying out garbage bags and twine. Henry Brelli was the only one who wasn't involved in the dismemberment process. In fact, it disgusted him and made him really queasy even thinking about it. He'd oftentimes get ribbed by the Gemini twins and Chris over it. It's almost like Henry would remember that they're human for a moment whenever they were being dismembered. Roy would lightheartedly say it's just like taking apart a deer. It's only a little weird if they're alive still. This likely elicited a few grins and some quizzical stares. Sometimes people couldn't tell when Roy was joking or when he was serious. Henry wasn't convinced. Although he'd rack up a kill count higher than Jack the Ripper and the Manson family combined eventually, he didn't want any part of the cutting up the corpses. It made him sick. Instead, he stepped outside in the darkness and waited for a while. Now, the crew loved eating while they worked. Sometimes they would later order pizza or White Castle, and they might have grabbed snacks off the shelves while they were doing this. Roy was intent on trying to make this the most jovial experience that it could possibly be. If there was any time left after they were done, that would give them time to fuck around and joke a little bit. Roy, like some deranged medical professor, showed them how to properly dismember and dispose of a corpse with his bone knives. First, Roy sawed off the head, and Joey stepped in, and together they severed the torso. The blood by this time had thickened. Then they removed the limbs. Each part was handed to Chris and Anthony, who wrapped the pieces in the garbage bags and tied them up. Now as they worked, blood would have been caking their arms, hands, and aprons. And Chris, this guy just couldn't get enough of debasing cats, suddenly seized the severed head. The crew probably watched with amused or wide eyes as Chris took Katz's head and stuck it in a box compactor and then turned it on. The head would have cracked and the eyes would have popped out as ruthless sheets of metal grinded together. Splintered shards of skull would have erupted and clumps of brain squirted out. Mushy gray, slimed, and sticky blood had to be scrubbed off the compactor so nobody would notice. Somebody, probably Chris, took a knife and ripped off Katz's penis. Now this was completely unnecessary, simply meant to further degrade what was left of the victim. That part of Katz was never found, might have been tossed in the garbage disposal like a future victim's would, or perhaps he threw it in a gutter or even fed it to a stray. I don't know if they eat those things, but maybe. Pantry Pride continued to operate for years after, so if anybody ever found the penis, maybe they tried to keep it quiet from the media. However, in their arrogance, the crew made several mistakes. After they were done, they hid Katz's body parts in a dumpster just in the back alley underneath some rotten vegetables outside of Pantry Pride. Now this was stupid because the evidence was right next to the crime scene and easy to find. It was also stupid because they presumed that garbage trucks would take it to the city dump the next day and nobody would check the dumpster. They forgot that the garbage trucks didn't run on the weekends and this was Brooklyn, which has a lot of homeless people always rooting through garbage. They call it dumpster diving. It only took a few days before a homeless man crawled into the garbage bin. The hopeful man sees something thinking it was a large piece of beef or pork or maybe lamb from the night before, uncontaminated in its wrappings. Then the homeless man dropped it. Somewhere a dog barked, its owner staring in horror. It was a leg. It was Katz's leg, lying on the ground. Now soon the cops would be examining the place, and the medical examiner, who was ironically related to Roy and had his last name, DeMeo, it was his dad's cousin, 
determined that a person with knowledge of anatomy, possibly a butcher, did this. He described Katz's head as flattened like a pancake, and it took dental records to identify him. As for Judy, she would eventually tell the police about Katz after Henry admitted to her that Katz was murdered. She didn't know who Chris and Anthony were, but Henry and Joey would almost go to prison for this. After that, Roy wouldn't make the same mistakes again. So when you think about the aftermath, Andrea Katz's parents had been Holocaust survivors. They'd survived hell, come to America, put their son in charge of a car shop, working to make a better lives for themselves. Yeah, he'd been a screw-up, but that didn't make it any better. And now they were in a new kind of hell. Their son was far worse than just dead. He'd been dissected like a lab project, except with less dignity. His body degraded in every way. His head crushed into something unrecognizable. Somebody close to Katz, one of his family, had to ID that. For them, it had to be a horrendous tragedy, something unimaginable. For the young men and Roy, it'd just been a bonding experience. A lot of mobsters didn't have the stomach for dismembering bodies. But Roy? Roy made it seem like it was no big deal. He was funny and he was cheerful, while taking swigs of vodka. Come on, who would cross a crew who would kill and make people vanish this easy? Their bonds grew that night. Roy made murder and dismemberment empowering. He made it fun. 